morning. Welcome to the University of Louisville Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, today, we are going to be hearing about air pollution effects on respiratory and general health uh, from Dr. David Peden, who is a North Carolina Tar Heel, and uh, he is Associate Dean for uh, Translational Research. But his full um, introduction will be done um, by his longtime colleague here at University of Louisville, uh, Dr. Tao Lee who's an associate professor and head of the allergy and immunology division here at University of Louisville. Uh, he has uh, come to us uh, from UCSF long ago and, uh, and Yale and Hopkins, and he's a, an amazing leader. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Dr. Lee. Uh, thank you, Dr. Williams. It's, a, it's an honor to introduce today's Grand Round speaker. I'll, 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 I'll uh, you know, like to say a little bit more here about Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. David Peden, who is the Harry S. Andrews Professor of Pediatrics, Medicine, Microbiology, Immunology, and serves as, again, as you mentioned, the Senior Associate Dean for Translational Research, Immunology, and Rheumatology, and is the Associate Director for, uh, at the Center for Environmental Medicine, Asthma, Lung Biology. Uh, for the University of North Carolina School of Medicine. Um, Dr. Peden received his Doctor of Medicine and Master's of Science in Pharmacology and to Toxicology degrees from West Virginia University and completed his residency and chief residency in pediatrics at West Virginia University Medical Center. His fellowship training in allergy and immunology was completed at uh, NIH, uh, at NAIAD, uh, and that's the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases uh, in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, Dr. Bishop is, I'm sorry, Dr. Uh, Peden is uh, uh, currently principal investigator for over 5 million uh, federally granted funded research from the EPA, NIH, and other agencies uh, that is primarily examining the effect uh, of challenge exposure to uh, certain environmental agents, including ozone, endotoxin, concentrated air particulates, and wood smoke particles. In addition to his research, he has previously served as the president of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. That's our National Academic Society, and currently serves uh, as the editor-in-chief of, I believe, the very new Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology Global. So uh, I have an interest in global health personally, so I'm very excited about that. So, But with that, welcome, Dave, uh, to University of Louisville. Uh, the, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for that uh, generous introduction, and and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with the uh, uh, University of Louisville Department of Medicine today. Let me uh, uh, okay. So that should be in presentation mode. Uh, uh, my presentation today will focus on air pollution effects on respiratory and general health. Uh, the uh, looks like we lost your presentation screen. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. you can share again. Are you seeing that now? Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, that's good. All right. So one thing I wanted to point out, sorry for the glitch at the beginning. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out that uh, air pollution is a significant cause of death worldwide. Uh, this is from, this slide is from the Lancet Commission on Pollution and Health uh, and uh, uh, estimating global estimated deaths associated with a variety of different uh, 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 either diseases or, or health uh, uh, exposures, uh, ranging all the way from interpersonal violence to uh, uh, road injuries, uh, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, drug use, smoking, and secondhand smoking, and all of that uh, is less th uh, or is less than deaths attributed to uh, pollution. So contaminated air, contaminated water. Uh, uh, are all significant uh, drivers of adverse health worldwide. In the United States, uh, we maintain uh, air quality standards, uh, and uh, those are regulated by the National Ambient Air Quality Standards that are part of the Clean Air Act. Uh, so the federal government outlines the regulations. State governments are, are uh, charged with developing uh, 
uh, programs to maintain certain levels of pollution or, or to stay below certain levels of pollution. Uh, and and uh, these levels of pollution have been translated into an air quality index, which you've probably heard about uh, with uh, various colors correlating to varying degrees of pollution that's uh, uh, relative to the, to the air quality standard. For particulate matter, less than 2.5 microns in size, uh, the current uh, uh, standard is 35 micrograms per cubic meter air. Uh, and, and so when you are uh, uh, above that uh, amount, uh, that's considered to be out of exceedance. And that is generally thought to be unhealthy for sensitive groups. Uh, for ozone, the current standard is 0 0.07 part per million, and uh, you, you, basically you can see that the uh, AQI categories for that, uh, the good level uh, uh, is uh, uh, from 0 to 60 part per million, moderate is, is, up, to the, is up to close to the standard, uh, and, uh, and then above that represents varying levels of exposure that are thought to be uh, more uh, harmful to, uh, to human health. Uh, this is uh, uh, across the year. This is what, uh, at least this is what the EPA said uh, uh, Louisville, Kentucky uh, looked like uh, over the course of the year. And uh, as is not uncommon, if you begin the ozone uh, monitoring season begins in April, ends in October. And if you look at those two months uh, and you see that uh, those are when uh, you have more exceedances for ozone uh, and uh, which are in the the dark uh, dots and then the open circles represent uh, uh, PM 2.5 levels on, on given days. Uh, and you can see that it's usually in the summer when most exceedances occur uh, uh, for most, uh, and this is certainly true in, in Louisville and most parts of the United States. So what happens to people who are exposed to pollutants? Well, our laboratory, which is uh, uh, an EPA laboratory that is run in conjunction with our group at the University of North Carolina, uh, we have specialized human exposure chambers. And what we do is, is we have used the human exposure chambers to, to, uh, uh, to determine human responses to ozone, to wood smoke, to particulate matter, uh, and to demonstrate uh, what happens with regards to uh, airway and systemic responses. Uh, in terms of the airway response to ozone, ozone causes an, uh, a nociceptive pain-related uh, decrease in lung function uh, as expressed as decreased in uh, the FEV1 and the FEC. Uh, and there's also an induction of airway inflammation. Those two phenomena are, are relatively disassociated. You can reverse the lung function change and still have uh, or, or prevent it with opiates and, and still have inflammation. Uh, and you can still have uh, some decreased lung function and still, uh, uh, even though you've diminished that with, with something like corticosteroids. But the point of this slide is to demonstrate that even at levels of below the current standard at 0 0.06 part per million ozone, there's both a decrease in lung function uh, and there's an increase in airway inflammation uh, 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 resulting from that exposure. So even very low levels of exposure uh, can cause increased inflammation. Uh, these were healthy young volunteers who weren't uh, didn't have any particular predisposing factors. Uh, we also uh, and, uh, decided to look at people who were being exposed without exercise. Most human exposure studies are done with exercise, which increases the amount of ventilation and therefore the effective dose of ozone. Uh, this study is of note because we asked uh, 14 volunteers to be exposed to 70 part per million, which is the current standard. And uh, they just sat in the room basically. So there was no increase in ventilation. And even at rest, uh, uh, exposure to this level of ozone would result in decreased lung function and increased airway inflammation. So while we, we do recommend that people avoid exercise on heavily polluted days if they are especially at risk, uh, uh, even with that admonition, uh, they can still have an adverse health outcome. We think much of the impact of air pollution in the airway with regards to uh, inflammation, be it from ozone or particulates, initially results from impact of the, of the pollutant on the airway mucosa, on the airway epithelium, uh, which causes uh, increased production of damage associated molecular patterns. It also results in activation of a toll-like receptor and 
in, in flammasome processes in airway macrophages that subsequently initiates a, an overall inflammatory response. This inflammation in certain circumstances can be seen systemically as well. Uh, and there are, in fact, not only airway inflammation effects, but there are changes in heart rate variability and subtle changes in, in, uh, in cardiac rhythm that can occasionally be associated with pollutant exposure, more so with particulates than with, with ozone. Uh, but the, uh, so the, the effect of the pollutants, while signaled in the airway, uh, can be systemic. And these are the list of things. If, if, if you were to take a board examination, uh, these are some of the things that might show up in terms of what happens with, re, with uh, uh, exposure to ozone. Now, we're interested in the acute airway inflammation, but uh, ozone causes the lung restriction, the inflammation, airway permeability, increased airway reactivity, uh, and the sources of ozone uh, on any given day are exposure to uh, oxides of nitrogen, uh, with polyaromatic poly uh, hydrocarbons, cooking all day with UV light. And that's why most ozone exceedances occur in the late afternoon. And again, that's why the ozone season in the United States tends to be in the sunnier months from April to October. Uh, particulate matter uh, is also pro-inflammatory. Uh, uh, there is some increased airway re reactivity. Uh, high doses can cause a acute decreased uh, lung function, but there are also cardiovascular effects on the coagulation system and heart rate variability. And those sources are primarily things burning, uh, whether it's uh, wood, uh, forests, uh, gasoline, uh, but uh, uh, burning uh, carbon-based fuels is the primary way uh, that particles are made. Uh, there can also be uh, 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 friction produced uh, uh, particles and proximity to heavily traveled roads can be a, a cause. And in the third world, indoor cooking can be a real cause for uh, indoor air pollution. What does pollution do in asthma? Uh, this is a study we did where we were comparing uh, healthy volunteers to, uh, uh, to mild allergic asthmatics and people uh, who had a positive skin test but did not have asthma. And what we found uh, were differences, especially in the asthma group, uh, in, uh, in how much interleukin-1 beta was produced uh, in response to, uh, in response to uh, ozone challenge. Uh, we found uh, uh, decreased IL-10 in, in the airways of asthmatics after ozone challenge, and IL-10 being an anti-inflammatory cytokine. And we also found uh, significant increases, more so in the, in the atopes and the, uh, in the asthmatics, in hyaluronic acid, which is a damage-associated molecular pattern that, uh, that can be generated uh, in the airway after uh, uh, injury to the airway epithelium. We also looked at gene expression profiling in cells recovered from uh, uh, normal volunteers in asthmatics. And what I hope you can appreciate is that uh, uh, persons with asthma have a differential gene expression profile related uh, to ozone challenge versus those from healthy volunteers. Uh, and there are specific increases in, uh, in uh, uh, pro-inflammatory gene transcripts that were found in, in these volunteers as well indicating that people with asthma have a somewhat increased uh, or augmented responsiveness uh, to ozone. And bear in mind that these are all cells from human volunteers and these asthmatics were exceptionally mild asthmatics. These are not the folks that would necessarily get uh, uh, referred to either a pulmonary or allergy clinic. The other thing we have found is that ozone and, in this case, endotoxin, which was a surrogate for uh, particles, as endotoxin is oftentimes found on particulate air pollutants, uh, what we found was that if persons are exposed to ozone and then undergo an inhaled allergen challenge, they, are, they respond to lesser amount of allergen following that exposure uh, relative to when they uh, undergo allergen challenge after a placebo or an air-controlled uh, exposure. Thus, uh, ozone challenge will augment immediate IgE responsiveness to allergen in the airway. We also found, if you uh, go to the uh, uh, blue background panel on, on the left and left lower uh, panel, that uh, airway eosinophilia is augmented uh, with ozone uh, followed by allergen versus cleaner followed by allergen. So the ozone challenge augments responsiveness uh, uh, to allergen. We found something very similar when we look at particle-bound endotoxin uh, and then did inhaled allergen challenge. 
uh, that uh, individuals require lesser amount of allergens to have a 20% drop in their FEV1. And likewise, if we uh, looked at uh, nasal airway uh, responsiveness, uh, we found that there was increased uh, eosinophilia uh, uh, primarily after a dual exposure with the endotoxin and, uh, and allergens. So pollutants will augment or enhance responsiveness to inhaled allergen. On an epidemiological scale, uh, this is actually from a fairly uh, uh, dated study, but these data are, if anything, even more replicated now. Uh, this is looking at the total number of uh, respiratory admissions to hospital accounting for varying levels of ozone. And I'll point out, if you look at the scale on the, uh, the x-axis, the level of ozone here is actually quite low. This is 40 parts per billion, or, 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 or you know, so it's much lower uh, than the current uh, standard, and, but you can see that the hospitalizations begin to tick up at 20 parts per billion and continue to increase in a, in a linear fashion uh, at 40 parts per billion. Again, demonstrating that sub-threshold or sub-standard uh, levels of, of uh, ozone can induce respiratory uh, uh, disease generation. Uh, the same thing occurs with, uh, uh, with particulate matter uh, and what I hope you can appreciate is that, uh, uh, is that with increased uh, amounts of fine particulate matter in the air, uh, this is a Chinese study, you have an increased uh, uh, relative risk of being hospitalized uh, or, or going to the emergency room or having clinic visits. In a more recent study in, uh, published in Lancet Planetary Health, uh, this is a, a study that is uh, backstopped on the Muppet study uh, looking at mepolizumab and, and pediatric asthma, they examined the effect of, uh, of the relationship of exposure to air pollution, uh, looking at different air, uh, air pollutants uh, uh, in the left-hand panel. Uh, this is the air quality index overall is on the top uh, with particulate matter ozone and NO2 uh, uh, going down. And then you can, hopefully you can appreciate uh, uh, the, uh, increase in admissions, uh, and there were four groups of, of, of uh, children that were in this study. There were those who, uh, when they got a cold, they would exacerbate, uh, they, or they would exacerbate uh, without a cold, or they didn't have exacerbations at all. And the group that, uh, uh, you know, that really increased with uh, the air pollution were those people that exacerbated, but did not require a viral infection to do so. And if you looked at their lung function relative to the air quality index, what I hope you can appreciate in the green colored bars, both with regards to FEV1% predicted or the FEV1 to FEC ratio, is that it's the children who exacerbated without a viral trigger were the ones that were very sensitive to, uh, to worsening of the air quality index. While it's been very clear that ozone and, uh, can augment response to pollution, uh, for a long time, it was not clear whether air pollution exposure would actually be involved in generation of asthma or actually be a risk factor for developing asthma. Uh, in this study that was published in 2002, uh, researchers in Southern California looked at the uh, occurrence in asthma in, in children who lived in ozone, uh, low ozone exposure communities and those who lived in high ozone exposure communities <laughs> and relative to the number of sports that those are outdoor sports that those children played, uh, the, the outdoor sports being a reflection of uh, activity that would have increased minute ventilation. And, uh, and what they found was that in the low ozone communities uh, where the reference group was, you know, which served as the reference group uh, with no sports played, the relative risk of developing asthma uh, did not change. You could argue slightly went down with the number of sports that were played. However, in the high ozone communities, uh, if you were outdoors a lot, as evidenced by having uh, played three or more sports, uh, there would be a 3.3 fold higher risk of developing asthma. And this study was one of the first that, that, that really brought attention to air pollution, not only being a cause for asthma or disease exacerbation, but for, uh, uh, for uh, pathogenesis of this disease as well. 
Similar studies have been done in Europe. Uh, this is a study looking at the occurrence of asthma and allergic rhinoconjunctivitis throughout childhood and adolescence. And this is looking at uh, uh, the, the odds ratios of association of the air pollution exposure at, at the birth address with asthma uh, uh, incidents relative to the, the PM exposure. Uh, and, uh, and what, uh, what was interesting here is that the, this, that the pollutant exposure occurred in early life, but that the risk of developing, uh, uh the, uh, uh, allergic disease wasn't really, uh, demonstrated until later in life, uh, in, uh, early adolescence. Uh, and this was true for uh, NO2, PM 2.5, uh, and, and PM 10, uh, so the, you know, the take home here is that, is that oftentimes the, the demonstration of disease may be pre, may, may happen years after the initial early life exposure. Uh, but again, this is a study uh, suggesting that uh, a pollutant exposure and community pollutant exposure can be associated with uh, increased risk for developing allergic disease. And this is another recent study from uh, the ECHO Consortium. And, uh, and uh, again, looking at the risk of asthma incidents uh, uh, and odds of asthma for PM 2.5 and NO2 exposure in early years of life. Uh, and uh, what I hope you can appreciate is that, uh, is that, uh, is that there are uh, significant increases in the likelihood at both at four years of age and 11 years of age of having an increased uh, risk of disease uh, relative to uh, increased exposure either in the first year of life or in the first uh, one to two or one to three years of life. Again, early life exposures seem to be related to uh, increased likelihood for having disease later in life. This phenomenon also uh, has uh, uh, health equity implications. Uh, this is a study from Sally Wenzel's group uh, in Pittsburgh, and what they looked at was uh, the uh, relative relationship of, of, of pollutant exposure and disease expression of asthma in persons uh, who lived in various neighborhoods uh, that were defined by redlining in uh, Allegheny County, Pens uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, as you may as you may know, redlining represented uh, a uh, a homeowner's or real estate practice of of uh, segregating uh, availability of housing uh, uh, based on the perceived quality uh, and environmental quality of the neighborhoods. Uh, and so the, the areas that were thought to be less desirable in this map of Pittsburgh uh, from uh, 1935 are the ones shown in purple. And uh, this, these are real busy slides and I'm, I'm showing all this just to really make a point. Uh, in in the uh, if you go back to the redlined areas, there were four uh, groups of homes that were thought to be uh, uh, d you know different degrees of desirability and affordability, and and those were uh, you know graded from A through D, uh, D being the the redlined neighborhoods. And what I hope you can appreciate in the panels on the left is if you look at the current pollutant exposure uh, in those neighborhoods be it measured by carbon monoxide, PM 2.5, sulfur oxide, volatile organic compounds, or, uh, uh, and also uh, the density of railroad tracks in the area. Uh, uh, all of that combined, what I hope you can appreciate is that the highest pollutant exposures occur uh, in those neighborhoods that were, that were redlined or, or in group D. And likewise, the various panels, uh, sub panels on figure four of the right of this article, uh, what I hope you appreciate from this is that if you look at asthma exacerbation, daily symptoms, uh, uncontrolled or severe asthma, all of that is also worse in those, uh, uh, in, uh, persons who live in homes in area D of this, uh, 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 in this uh, community. So, uh, so the air, air pollution and air pollution uh, uh, policies not only have uh, general uh, uh, pollution level issues, but there's also health equity issues that have to be considered as well. Uh, so uh, air pollution and asthma, ozone and PM 2.5 are associated with exacerbation, 
uh, pollution is associated with incidence of disease in children. Uh, asthma incidence is, uh, can be noted years after the early life or perinatal exposure. And there are environmental equity issues in which persons of color, persons with decreased economic resources live in more polluted areas. And that's associated with increased occurrence of disease. Uh, I'd like to move now to the impact of pollution on cardiovascular disease. Uh, much of, the, uh, there's been work in New York and in California. I'm going to show a snippet of some of this information. Uh, this is a, a map of, San, uh, of, uh, California. Uh, I think, yeah, I think you can appreciate San Francisco and San Francisco Bay. And this is central California, which is, uh, actually one of the heaviest areas of, of particulate matter pollution, uh, in the United States, largely associated with the agricultural, uh, uh, businesses that uh, and and industry that resides there, uh, and uh, I actually used to live in Modesto, California, when I was a kid, uh, and uh, that was very agriculturally busy. You know, there was a lot of ag business around that, and a lot of farming, uh, and right in the middle of that were chemical plants. And my my father worked at one of those. So that that but that that red swatch area is the is where there's the highest level of PM two point five. And, uh, and uh, this, uh, this article is basically depicting the association of long-term exposure, particular air pollution with cardiovascular events uh, in California. And again, you have uh, 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 myocardial infarction and, and the risk of this, and you have uh, IDH and, and cardiovascular disease. And the upshot is that if you go from in, in quadrant one, uh, where there's a high socioeconomic status in areas that uh, have, uh, if you look at the, uh, by, uh, by neighborhood education, which is a reflection of a, of a uh, social determinant of health, uh, where, where this risk of environmental impact on heart disease is most seen is in areas where, uh, as where uh, residents are associated with having less education and therefore less buying power for, for housing uh, and a lower socioeconomic uh, status. And so the upshot of this is that there's also a health equity issue related here uh, where uh, the, the burden of adverse uh, air quality is not borne equally across the population. Uh, th this is looking at the percentage change in, in hospitalization rate for myocardial infarction related to particulate matter exposure. Uh, and you know there are some increases across all ages. You see, it's the highest actually at a younger age group, but then it peaks again at groups above age six, uh, above age seventy-five. Uh, and in very general terms, it's thought that the risk of particulate matter-related MIs uh, and cardiac events is especially great uh, in most studies at age sixty-five or higher, and this one at age seventy-five. And again, if you look at uh, the percent change in hospitalization rate for myocardial infarction. And if you look at the, at the SES factor uh, that's associated with this, you see that uh, 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 demonstration of poverty or population density uh, uh, in which the percentiles are higher for those markers are associated with increased risk uh, for hospitalization related to pollutant exposure. This is also seen in the context of uh, blood pressure control. Uh, this is a study by in, in environmental pollution by Yang and colleagues. Uh, uh, and what they found was that uh, if you looked at uh, uh, PM 2.5 uh, uh, in terms of long-term effects on blood pressure control, there was an increased risk of, of hypertension. And if you look at short-term effects, in other words, uh, increases in blood pressure immediately after an air pollution event, uh, this is seen with, uh, with PM10, PM2.5, NO2, which tracks a lot with, with particulate matter, and sulfur oxide. Not so much with ozone. Uh, but again, there's, uh, there's effects of uh, uh, particulate matter on cardiovascular disease. And this is thought to be, and I'm not going to uh, go over this entire slide, but uh, this is an overall paradigm of how it's thought that uh, air pollution increases oxidative stress in the airway but then that gets reflected in the cardiovascular system and that impacts uh, autonomic intolerance, endothelial dysfunction, HP axis activation and systemic inflammation and thrombolytic pathways uh, uh, across a wide variety of systems, 
all of that impacting on vascular uh, processes that the increased risk uh, for uh, cardiovascular outcomes. Air pollution also had an impact on COVID outcomes. I don't know that that's, uh, at this point, that may or may not be terribly surprising to people, uh, but it proved to be a really important uh, uh, thing to consider uh, when looking at the effect of uh, the impact of COVID. Uh, so uh, this is a study from uh, 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 senior authors, Allison Lee at Mount Sinai in New York. And uh, what, what I uh, uh, hope you can appreciate is uh, uh, the number of patients with COVID uh, in, in uh, areas in New York uh, is in panel A. Panel B represented the, uh, uh, the, the, PM to, uh, the, the PM levels in December 2018 through December 2019, the, area, uh, the time frame in which the study was conducted. So you can see, first of all, I think you get a sense that there are more patients in areas where there's more pollution. And uh, when they looked at the, uh, that the uh, associations between long-term exposure to particulate matter and COVID-19 mortality by race or ethnicity, <clears throat> they looked at mortality, ICU admission and intubation and the risk of that. And uh, there, was a, you know, there were significantly increased risks uh, in, in some of these measures, uh, not so much in the black population, but in the Hispanic population, there is uh, uh, particularly in persons uh, in persons that were less than 65 years of age. Uh, there, the uh, the risk was higher. The same for ICU admission uh, and for intubation, uh, and that uh, there were no increased risks uh, related to P, uh, to PM uh, in, in other um, uh, ethnic groups. Uh, Likewise, there's, uh, if you look at, I don't know if my, you know, but, and if you look at the associates between long-term free uh, exposure uh, and uh, different thresholds for COVID more, uh, mortality based on the, uh, the pollutant exposure, uh, what you can see is that there were significant increases in mortality, uh, even at pretty low levels of, uh, of PM 2.5 exposure. So. Uh, so uh, the, air, the, the, the impact of particulate matter air pollution, most notably on COVID outcomes, is very uh, significant. Uh, this is a, a similar study from Kaiser looking at uh, COVID-related uh, mortality and ICU admissions. And again, uh, it's really very much the same thing. If you look at PM 2.5 and look at uh, NO2, uh, which is uh, oftentimes tracks with PM 2.5, uh, those pollutants were, were most commonly associated with increased risk of mortality and, and uh, markers of, uh, of uh, COVID morbidity uh, uh, with regards to pollutant exposure impact on this disease. So air pollution, like with, like with asthma and like with cardiovascular disease, uh, air pollution uh, it does worsen COVID, uh, and uh, and that's most notably seen in uh, inner cities and in uh, heavily populated areas. Wildfire has uh, re has received a lot of attention in the United States. Uh, uh, last summer, uh, with the Canadian wildfires uh, drifting, uh, with that PM uh, drifting into uh, uh, into the well, initially the Northeast, but actually uh, went into the Midwest as well, uh, we see uh, very significant impacts uh, on human health. And this is primarily reflected by increases in community levels of particulate matter. Uh, this slide is from the EPA. And while it's a little bit dated, the trend is actually still increasing. This is the, the number of acreage burn in the United States comparing 1975 through 2015. So overall, uh, we do see increased wildfire, and it's anticipated that with uh, with climate change and, and with water use policies, there's going to be continued uh, difficulties with wildfire because the conditions for wildfires are are only worsening in in uh, timbered areas of the United States. Uh, 
just to give you a sense of how much acute change in, in particulate matter can occur as a result of a wildfire, uh, uh, I'm showing you this, uh, this picture of a wildfire uh, associated with this article uh, in 2016, where uh, the daily mass in, uh, intake breathing PM uh, it was uh, up to about 486 micrograms per cubic meter, which is substantially higher than the uh, uh, than the current U.S. standard. Uh, likewise, if you look at the daily mass intake of of, of uh, micrograms of PM per person in areas affected by wildfire, you can see that uh, in the red areas where there were significant wildfire exposures, there's a much greater intake, estimated intake of, of PM 2.5 uh, you know, during an acute fire relative to, uh, uh, you know, relative to areas that were less affected. So wildfire can have, uh, can have a very abrupt uh, change or cause a very abrupt change in PM 2.5, uh, you know, exposure up to 35 times greater than the current standard. This is a study that was done in uh, uh, after an event that occurred in 2008 in North Carolina, we had a peak bob fire in uh, in uh, Eastern Carolina, and we had uh, 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 counties that were exposed and uh, counties with a very similar demographic and SES status that were not exposed, and they were the uh, they were the reference groups. And in in our study, what we found is that there was in all respiratory tract illnesses related to uh, the PM uh, 2.5, not so much cardiovascular events in this study, but if, uh, if you go back to California and look at the days affected by, by wildfire smoke, and that's what these maps represent, is increase in, in wildfire-related PM 2.5 and the days affected by smoke. What I hope you can appreciate is that that's also associated, superimposed on those areas are, are, are excess emergency room visits for COPD, uh, respiratory diseases of any type in panel D, and excess cardiovascular uh, uh, events. So wildfire exposures uh, uh, cause both acute respiratory and acute cardiovascular events as well. The persons that are most likely to have an adverse cardiovascular event, uh, which is a heart attack or a stroke, uh, due to wildfire-based PM 2.5, uh, are, are persons uh, above the age of 65. So this is with this is the relative risk related to light, medium, or heavy uh, wildfire PM 2.5 exposure. Uh, and you can see in each one of these groups, uh, the ones the, the persons that are affected are adults above 65 years of age. Uh, there is a general increase uh, in. You, know, you can see you know, younger adults, uh, middle-aged adults, uh, and then all adults, but it's the uh, persons above 65 that are at higher risk. If you're looking for a specific group to counsel uh, uh, to avoid PM exposure, uh, you know, it would be that subgroup that you would pay attention to. So you're a clinician, you've got patients, you're uh, in, and uh, you you know you get a call that someone is uh, one of your patients is in an area and suddenly there's a wildfire and you know they want to know you know what they should do or or what they might be able to do uh, to minimize uh, their exposure to PM two point five or to, to, to the wildfire smoke. Uh, there are some things that are being studied uh, that might provide some answers to that and none of this has been FDA approved, but. Uh, Here's some things that we've looked at or that other folks have looked at. One is, can you mitigate uh, uh, the impact of airborne particles by, uh, uh, by uh, HEPA filters or air filtration? So this is a study uh, led by Meredith McCormick at Johns Hopkins. And what they did is they looked at long, you know, they looked at, uh, they took bedrooms and this was actually looking at just chronic PM 2.5 exposure. And they looked at, a, uh, they were looking at, first of all, the level of PM 2.5 in the bedroom and outdoors. And they had uh, people who had an actual filtration device and people who had sham filtration as a placebo control. And they did demonstrate that, uh, that there was no change in ozone levels, which one wouldn't have expected, but there was a significant decrease in the amount of PM 2.5 that people had in their homes related to uh, uh, use of, uh, of a high efficiency uh, filtration device. Uh, and if you looked at uh, 
uh, improvement with filtration for a number of, of outcomes. Uh, 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 you know, it, it, this is comparing true filtration versus sand filtration in almost every measure of impulse oscillometry and in measures of spirometry and airway inflammation is reflected by FENO, uh, there was uh, significant improvement uh, in those people who, re you know, who were uh, received the true filtration intervention. Likewise, uh, if they looked at these uh, COPD patients that uh, uh, com comparing the outcomes of bedroom fine particle exposure reduction. So this was, this was active versus placebo, and this is actually measuring the PM 2.5. Uh, they found that there was... Uh, uh, notable improvement as they had reduction in PM10, or I'm sorry, in PM2.5. So the upshot here is that you can demonstrate that there's lesser amounts of, of particles inside uh, living spaces with filtration. And at least in this population that was associated with better health outcomes. They also looked at cardiovascular events in those same individuals. And again, what, uh, what the take home message here was is that uh, uh, they, they did find, for the most part, that cardiovascular outcomes were improved, uh, that the change in heart rate variability at six months was improved when uh, people were treated with active filtration. So filtration uh, is one approach that one might take to minimize the effect of uh, PM 2.5 uh, which penetrates uh, houses pretty easily uh, in persons, especially if you have elderly populations that you're taking care of. Uh, another uh, 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 intervention that we used to look at proof of concept for is whether or not uh, either inhaled corticosteroid pretreatment or immediate treatment with prednisone after either an ozone, which is on the left-hand panel, or a PM 2.5 exposure on the right-hand panel, uh, uh, results in decreased airway inflammation. <clears throat> in our in our experience, we did re we did see decreased airway inflammation resulting from these interventions. Now, this is a proof of concept study. This is not to say that there's any uh, uh, large based clinical trial that has looked at uh, uh, emergency use of oral prednisone in in at risk populations uh, that are unavoidably exposed to increased levels of PM two point five. But this does point to uh, a, a more general concept, which is if you have a disorder that's characterized by airway inflammation like asthma or COPD, uh, that, that you might have better uh, uh, control of the outcome of a, uh, of a uh, PM exposure if you maintain better control. I do think this is worth continued uh, study and we're proposing studies in the field to look at these kinds of interventions. But this is another approach that... Uh, uh, that we've been studying as well. So with regards to a number of personal interventions that have been, that have been examined, corticosteroids, there's good evidence that pretreatment with corticosteroids or immediate treatment with, uh, with prednisone after wood smoke exposure will reduce airway inflammation. Antioxidant vitamins, uh, we've been interested in that. Uh, we have some evidence that gamma tocopherol, which is a variant of vitamin E, might help. There were studies in children looking at children who had a specific molecular defect in antioxidant mechanisms called glutathione as transferase at mu1. Uh, it turns out that uh, only those kids who were deficient in that enzyme benefited from uh, uh, protection of lung function with uh, ozone exposure in Mexico City. Uh, there are some uh, proof of concept studies that certain cytokine inhibitors might be useful. I don't think that's a viable public health approach, but uh, that's, a, uh, that's a mechanistic approach that uh, we've examined. Uh, filtration in residential units, I think, would be uh, very, very useful. Uh, and in asthma studies, homes with smokers were found to uh, uh, be related, you know, or children who lived in homes with smokers had less uh, asthma exacerbations uh, with L filtration devices. Uh, masking seems like it would be a really good idea for people uh, to minimize their uh, response to PM 2.5. And personally, that's what I recommend for people. Adherence to that is really low. It's not clear whether you really require a PM 2.5 or, or a, an N95 filtration device or whether a regular mask would be helpful. Uh, that's an area of investigation right now with our EPA colleagues, and hopefully in the next year or two, we'll have some actual data demonstrating whether masks that have what we would expect would be the obvious effect, which would be to protect you from 
uh, responses to PM. However, the most significant interventions that have been useful have been policy interventions. Uh, and this has been shown, frankly, over and over again, that when, uh, when communities make real efforts to reduce uh, their uh, air pollution burden, uh, they, that's associated with significantly improved health outcomes. One of the most famous was the 1996 Summer Olympic Games in Atlanta. Uh, as I suspect many of you are aware, uh, with the Olympic Games, uh, every host city is asked to, to demonstrate what they're going to do to minimize air pollution during the time of the Games. Uh, that's, that's usually a significant part of the plan of awarding the, uh, the Games to a given area. And, uh, and uh, in this particular study that was done in Georgia, you know, they looked at a number of health outcomes uh, in this case, it was acute asthma events and acute non-asthma events. Uh, and they looked at uh, a number of data sources, the Georgia Medicaid claims, uh, use of a health maintenance organization for emergency care, urgent care and hospitalizations, pediatric ED, uh, you know, emergency care and hospitalizations, and uh, the, the Georgia Hospital Discharge Database. And they looked at the mean number of events per day prior to the Olympic Games and during the Olympic period. And what was noted is that during the Olympic period uh, with the asthma events, all of these were significantly reduced and that uh, hypothetically is associated with the cleaner air that was present during that time. Non-asthma events, which was kind of a control of just general ER use, uh, did not have, was not really associated with significant uh, uh, changes during that same time frame. So at least with, with asthma being a, a, a sentinel event, uh, there is a demonstration that uh, community efforts and regulatory efforts to reduce air, uh, air pollution and improve air quality are associated with improved health outcomes. This is a more long-term study. Uh, uh, this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2015 by Gowderman and colleagues. And what they looked at was the levels of community levels of, of nitrogen dioxide, ozone, PM 2.5, and PM 10 uh, you know, from 1995 through uh, 2012, I think, in uh, a variety of, of, of locations. And for the most part, with the exception of Long Beach, which is on the ocean front, uh, there were community reductions in just about every pollution during this time frame, that is felt to be due to changes in, in uh, regulation of pollution in California. And this was associated with improvement in, in lung growth. So uh, in each one of these communities, uh, what, you, what, what one saw was as there was a, uh, a, a decrease uh, in the amount of pollutant expo uh, uh, encountered there was an increase in pediatric uh, 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 lung growth as measured by improvement in FEV1 uh, or improvement in FEC over time, demonstrating that with, a, with lesser polluted air, uh, there was better uh, development of, of lung function. In a second publication out of the same study, uh, they also looked at the uh, uh, that the relative changes in bronchitic systems associated, associated with reductions in air pollution uh, by asthma status uh, in 1993 to 2012. And again, in 10-year-old asthmatics versus non-asthmatics and in 15-year-old asthmatics versus non-asthmatics, uh, there are actually improvements in bronchitic symptoms or, or, uh, in both groups, uh, more so in the kids with asthma than in those without asthma. Uh, but all of this was related with improvements in nitrogen dioxide, ozone, and particulate matter, all of these being statistically significant. Uh, again, demonstrating that uh, with uh, community efforts to reduce air pollution, there will be improvements in health outcomes. So the, uh, the well, so my, my summary with regards to interventions uh, and, and what we can do, and, and sometimes it seems frustrating with everything going on with regards to air quality and uh, our discussions about climate change, uh, but community interventions do work. There's no question that with uh, regulatory attention to air quality, there will be cleaner air, 
there will be improved health outcomes, and ultimately there will be a lower death rates. And this has been shown, you know, uh, the examples are the, the 1996 Olympic Games. Uh, this was also repeated in, in, in studies done around Beijing in the 2008 Games. Uh, the, in North Carolina, we have a Clean Smokestacks Act, and we've seen the same thing. So with reduced asthma, emphysema, and pneumonia associated with decreased pollutant levels. And I uh, showed you the, the, the data uh, from California. Uh, so I think uh, with that, uh, you know, pollution is a significant public health crisis. Ozone and PM 2.5 are critical air pollutants. Uh, ozone is bad. PM 2.5 is likely worse. <coughs> Uh, ozone is very seasonal. It happened, you know, you see it pop up in April and it lasts till October. And that's because of the UV light requirement to produce ozone and it's made fresh every day for you. Uh, PM exposures year round, both have notable respiratory effects. Uh, there's also notable cardiovascular effects. In fact, I didn't share these data. Uh, there have been demonstrations of impacts of air pollution on in persons with diabetes, uh, impacts of air pollution effects on, on uh, psychiatric outcomes, uh, neurocognitive effects, uh, uh, and general effects on lung infection. Uh, there are personal interventions that are evolving, and all of these re you know, require more study. Uh, I think uh, you know, HEPA filter and masks are potentially most useful and perhaps most likely to be uh, taken up by some families. Uh, Antioxidants may be useful, uh, but the data are scattered and, and they're probably not as reliable as masking. Uh, and most importantly, public health interventions work. And so I would ask that you advocate for those whenever possible. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and hopefully I've not babbled incessantly at you for most of the morning. Dr. Peden, that was uh, amazing, encyclopedic, and so informative. I don't think uh, most of us uh, recognize the cardiopulmonary effects and that we can actually intervene. Um, turning it over to uh, Dr. Lee. Uh, very good. Uh, I'll, I'll start off yes, as a facility programmer with, with a, a, a kind of a broad question. Dave, Dave, you and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, uh, you know how how um, you know what what are what 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 are you anticipating with regards to climate change in North America and how this may impact pollution level, ozone levels, and therefore uh, potentially uh, respiratory, cardiovascular disease, and allergic disease. Well, so so there are a number of climatologic. Uh, 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 modeling exercises that are done that look at, uh, you know, how, you know, because all these things are, are woven together. I mean, the more pollution there is, the more air trapping there is, the hotter the atmosphere gets, the more pollution there is. And so it becomes a bit of a cycle. Uh, but there's most of the models suggest that there will be increased numbers of ozone exceedances. There will be increased numbers of particulate matter events. And perhaps most scary, there's going to be an increasing number of so-called wildfire events. You're just gonna have more arid areas. You're gonna have more difficulties with water use. Uh, you're gonna have uh, uh, you know, more uh, fall events. The Smoky Mountains will truly be smoky uh, at times because uh, there are wildfire events. Conversely, if you look at global environmental change, Areas, uh, you know, uh, areas where flooding is an issue, you have kind of an almost opposite effect, not so much with air pollution, but you have water damage and you have other issues that, you know, that's actually worth considering as well. And uh, I think, you know, most people who have ever had to take care of folks that have experienced flooding would tell you that uh, that you know, there are a whole different cadre of health outcomes associated with, with, with flooding and water intrusions as well. And I think most environmental models suggest that both are gonna happen. Uh, they may, you know, some may impact some areas more than others, but to get at your question, there's gonna be more bad ozone days. There's gonna be more PM in the air unless we do something about it. Very good. Uh, I, see, I do see some questions coming into the chat. And again, if, if you do have a question, feel free to uh, uh, drop it into the chat or, or raise your hand. And I, I think uh, uh, Mr. Puckett can uh, unmute your microphone. Uh, so we have a question here from Dr. Emmons in the chat. I can just read it out. Is there any evidence that the previous use of CFC were beneficial for removal of ozone from the troposphere, though detrimental for the stratosphere? I noticed your graph showed decreases uh, except ozone. Has the ozone problem worsened as CFC has been restricted? Is there clinical evidence for this, or do the other quality issues cloud this? Are there any heavy chlorine-based gases that could help clear the troposphere? 
Well, I'll answer that as best as I can. I'm not an atmospheric chemist, but the CFC issue was really designed to, to protect the ozone at the, at the stratosphere, which is where UV light, it was, the, is, it was to uh, reduce the, 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 the risk of having excess UV light penetrate the, the beneficial ozone layer at, at the upper atmosphere. Uh, so the, the, the levels of ozone that we see in the, uh, 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 in the troposphere you know, below that stratospheric area, the, those are those are generated every day and then they go away every day and then they're generated new every day and they're generated fresh with uh, uh, as a result of the interaction of uh, UV light with uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons and oxides of nitrogen. So it, it's that immediate combustion that then reacts in the air. And that's when and most ozone levels peak in the mid afternoon and last into the early evening. I can't speak to whether the CFC, uh, the elimination of CFCs, uh, and and and, and him, what that's done specifically to lower level ozone levels. I mean, the the point of that regulation though was to protect the uh, stratospheric ozone. Very good. Um, uh, you know, uh, look, don't see any other questions. I I do have a couple questions. Some somebody just messaged me with a question actually. Um, you, you know, you, you mentioned the, the studies earlier, uh, you know, associating uh, COVID, uh, you know, as a cofactor or covariant uh, or uh, 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 um, for, for worsening COVID outcomes. But at the same time, particularly during the early days of the pandemic, uh, there were dramatic drops uh, potentially in, uh, or, you know, in, in traffic and, you know, uh, and potentially in ambient air pollution. We, can, can you comment, were there any studies that kind of documented that and uh, uh, um, uh, and the association between what was out there with regards to particulate matter, ozone, and associate, uh, uh, re you know, uh, allergic respiratory and cardiovascular disease. Uh, there, there were certainly decreases in ozone and PM related to decreased traffic use uh, in, in the early days of the pandemic. Most of the studies that were looking at the interface between uh, particulate matter exposure and, and COVID outcomes uh, are looking at people who had long-term chronic high increase uh, uh, PM exposure and then were confronted with COVID. So these are, you know, they may not have been immediately exposed to PM, but they had had, you know, several years of being exposed to PM levels at, at an elevated level. Uh, and, uh, and then when they got COVID, that's when they ended up having, you know, those were the people that had worse problems. Very good. Yeah, yeah. So, just curious, like it, like it was like if there was like an event similar like to the 1996 Olympics, because it was very sudden. Um, so, okay. Uh, uh, um, any other questions uh, from the group? Um, uh, Dr. Peden, uh, you know, uh, and maybe you can comment on this because of your involvement with EPA. Um, the the um, Federal government just released new guidelines a couple of days ago with regards to tailpipe emissions and so forth. And, uh, you know, it's been controversial for a number of reasons, uh, you know, uh, but it, it, it's trying to maintain uh, reduction tailpipe emissions by helping, by encouraging the conversion of uh, cars and fleets to either hybrid or plug-in hybrids or EV or so forth. Can you comment on, 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 on those national policies societal policies and what you think may be effective uh, for um, reducing, um, you know, uh, uh, again, respiratory cardiovascular disease from these types of exposures? Well, most engineers and most modeling would, uh, uh, would demonstrate that, uh, that use of more use of electric vehicles, more use of hybrid vehicles and less generation of, of exhaust is clearly associated with, with, uh, uh, predicted decrease amounts of those pollutants relative to the use of, of traditional internal combustion engines. Uh, it is a, uh, uh, it's more, and that's even accounting for the production of electricity that's required to, to recharge the electric vehicles. Uh, you know, there's, there's, it's not that there's no pollution related to electric vehicles. You have to generate the electricity, but there are a variety of ways that we can achieve that. Uh, there, uh, so, so those data are really pretty clear. Uh, I used to serve on the North Carolina Environmental Management Com Commission, which you know, had both quasi-judicial as well as quasi-legislative roles. And uh, I would argue any physician who, who wants to understand 
how policy is made, spend some time either helping to make policy or watching it being made. And it's, uh, you know, uh, you going to the sausage factory will make you appreciate what you're eating when you're eating sausage. And the same thing is true for regulatory events. Uh, you know, it, it, it's always a trade-off. And I think the problem is, is when everyone believes they're absolutely right or that the other side is absolutely wrong. The truth of the matter is, is that people do want jobs and jobs are associated with certain types of, of, of vehicles. Uh, those same people want to breathe. And so, you know, so finding the right kinetic that allows change to occur uh, at, a, at, at a level that's going to be acceptable to most of the population is what ultimately you have to deal with. I think the problem we have now is that, uh, is that the climate change crisis is very real. Uh, I, and, you know, I, and I'm not, I'm not trying to make a political statement. It just is. Uh, there, and there, and uh, so all these decisions will matter. Uh, that's why you saw a little bit of pushback and if the government, you know, you know, pushing, you know, releasing a little bit of what they were hoping to do with the tailpipe emission standards. Uh, but uh, I think there always need to be health outcomes at the table uh, when these things are decided and when they're being discussed, because otherwise uh, people are going to forget it. And the other thing I think is, is, is really important. It's the reason I wanted to demonstrate it. And I, I, I probably threw too many slides in today, but the, uh, the health disparities impact of, of environmental pollution is extremely real. Uh, and I think that, I, I think that uh, you know, that the clean air issue is not just a, a general societal issue. I think it's a health equity issue as well. And I think that, uh, you know, we, we need to pay real attention to, to not just what the pollution is, but who's being polluted and, and how we mitigate that entire problem. Great. Thank you. Thank you well, for that fantastic. question, Dr. Pete. And uh, I, I know we're at the top of the hour, so I'd like to hand it back to Dr. Williams to uh, wrap us up. <laughs> Just want to say thank you again. Uh, comprehensive, uh, informative, and actionable. Uh, we should all be galvanized by this to uh, get involved with the political process and clean up our air. Uh, so I really appreciate uh, uh, the time that you spent with us this morning, and we can let everyone go and get started with the Cardinal Minute. And just and real quick before we go, uh, Dr. Peden, we have a we have a little gift for our uh, grand round speakers, especially our uh, those that are joining us from out of town. We have a little little gift, and it's uh, synonymous with uh, the city of Louisville. So we will be sending you your very own um, personalized Louisville Slugger bat. <laughs> so I love it. Yeah. So, so we'll get that we'll get that to you just and uh, just to thank everybody for joining us uh we'll be back next week uh the internal medicine uh, uh dr uh christian Furman will be um presenting and uh she'll be discussing the uh, things she learned as a health policy fellow in washington dc over the last year couple of years so that i'm really looking forward to that so thank you dr peden thank you dr lee for facilitating another great great talk we really appreciate this every year this is great great thank you again appreciate so, the invitation so we can, yeah, we can leave uh, and then click back on 